All right, three, two, one, it started. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone here to the uh, lunchtime, noontime seminar series. Uh, today, we have a special guest from us from the Carleton University in Ontario, Canada, uh, Maria DeRosa. She's actually a full professor in the Department of Chemistry, and she's been researching a, a, a synthetic nucleate acids known as apatars, which can be folded into 3D nanoparticle structures. And these, these, uh, part, these nanoparticles have tremendous binding ability, so they can bind tightly to, to specific molecular targets. Um, she's um, going to talk today about how um, fertilizers, uh, title for food safety to fertilizers and combining nanotechnology and molecular recognition. But before we get into that, I just want to mention that in 2010, Maria wrote a paper for Nature Nanotechnology that um, was about nano fertilizers and the, uh, their, their potential. And that was a really a keynote uh, manuscript that Jason was very influenced by. He actually went on to, um, to another paper in 2012 looking how copper could be moved inside plants. And that was the keynote paper that got me interested in nanotechnology. So this all kind of st uh, stems from Maria's first paper. So, you know, she did really was responsible for uh, stimulating a lot of great research and a lot of and a total new direction in my program. So I'm really excited to have her here today. And like I mentioned, her title will be From Food Safety to Fertilizers, Combining Nanotechnology and Molecular Recognition. Maria. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that kind intro. And, you know, that's really great to hear how something that, you know, we wrote all those years ago uh, had an influence. And, and that was the whole idea of that, that paper was just to get other people as excited about nanotechnology for agriculture as we were. Okay, so um, I hope everybody uh, can see me and, and see my slides and I'll be talking today for the next little bit about this type of nanotechnology that we're working on. It's DNA based and I'll explain, you know, where it comes from and what it's good for. And hopefully I'll be able to have a chance to convince you that there are a lot of great applications for this technology. So uh, hi everyone from Ottawa, Canada, and I'm really delighted to be here. All right, so let's see if we can get this going. So the goal for today is to talk to you about, as you heard, these synthetic nucleic acids that are called aptamers, and these are nanotechnology, um, uh, nano objects that have really interesting properties, and I think those properties can be applied to agriculture. So let's talk about that. How could they be applied to agriculture? So we'll focus on that uh, in this talk. And the idea is that they can be used for detection. So they're receptors, so the idea that they can, um, you know, be used for things like sensing, but also beyond. And that's where that fertilizer uh, idea comes from. Can it be something, a technology we can develop that could do more than just sense what's in the environment? Can it respond to the environment? All right, so this little cartoon is, is kind of my talk in a, in a picture. And I hope that I'll have a chance to talk about all these different things. We do a lot of work in food safety and some of the aptamers that we develop are for things called mycotoxins, which you may be aware of, are, are ag agricultural toxins of economic and, and health concern. And we developed strip tests for that. So I have a short little, you know, couple slides to talk about that work. But then I want to get into the second half of our talk where we're talking about our smart fertilizer. And this is the idea that we're detecting signals in the rhizosphere. So signals coming from crop roots and using those to deliver nutrients at, uh, as in a smart way. And if I have time, I'll talk about two other projects where we're using aptamers for delivery and aptamer for stress protection. Before I do that, let me first give you some background, some inspiration, you know, why am I inspired to work in this area and why am I interested in using nanotechnology, particularly nanotechnology from DNA, which is, you know, this really, uh, it's, it's biological entity, right? People are used to thinking about DNA in terms of breeding, DNA in terms of genomics. And I'm using it in this kind of really synthetic way. So why do I want to use DNA in this very synthetic way? This is a quote from Roald Hoffman, a Nobel laureate and chemist, just like me, who talks about in, in an essay that's, you know, now 30 years old, more than 30 years old, or give or take, um, DNA as clay was the name of this essay. And he said that nucleic acids, so DNA, RNA, they, they're optimized chemistry, 
let's use them to do something new, maybe useful, certainly unnatural. So this is the, the, the inspiration for a whole field of work called DNA nanotechnology. And we're doing one little small little bit and trying to apply it to agriculture. So let's learn about, you know, what are, what are these, these little entities of DNA that we're working with? So these things are called aptamers. And if you look at the, the name, I mean, apt, fitting, to fit. This idea is that they're synthetic nucleic acids that fit around a target molecule or bind to a target molecule. So what you're looking at here, this red ribbon, this is just a tiny little sequence of DNA. Uh, uh, and the ribbon is the backbone and those rods that are coming out are the bases of the DNA. And this little squiggle of DNA has folded up into a nanoscale shape. Looks like a hairpin, uh, so like a bobby pin that someone might be using to, to decorate their hair. And if you look at the top, there's a little pocket, right? The, the fold is sort of, you know, dipping down and inside that pocket is a blue molecule. That molecule is an amino acid. And this is a visual idea of why aptamers are interesting. This little squiggle makes a pocket, a nanoscale kind of receptor, and inside that pocket, one specific target can fit. So you can kind of think of it like a lock and a key. The aptamer makes the shape of the lock and only one molecule can fit inside. And that becomes the basis of all sorts of interesting technology once you can find these aptamers and once you can you know, apply them to all sorts of different things. So what are the exciting properties of these molecules? One, they bind their targets with high affinity. So an aptamer that's developed for a certain uh, toxin, say, for example, you won't need a lot of that toxin around in order for the aptamer to find it and bind to it because it binds so tightly. What else is great about these things? They can be very specific. So by specific, you know, they'll bind to one target and ignore something that looks very similar. And the, the example that constantly gets given, this is this molecule here is thiophylline. It's a it's an asthma drug. But if I change on this you know, nitrogen group here on this little spot on the molecule. If I change that just ever so slightly, I can make caffeine, which is, you know, our favorite part of coffee. The aptamer that recognizes this molecule cannot recognize caffeine. 10,000 fold less affinity with one small molecular change. So that can be super useful if you're trying to detect something. So if I want to make a sensor for molecule A, I don't want to be fooled to say that you know, when I see molecule B, yes, A is present. Um, and so that's why we're, we're one of the reasons why we're super interested in using these molecules because of these properties. OK, so in my research group in Ottawa, we um, have kind of a pipeline. So we have to discover new aptamers, characterize them by a suite of techniques, and then we can apply them to interesting things like agriculture. So aptamers that we've discovered uh, in the past, we've uh, discovered these mycotoxin aptamers. I'll talk about those. I'll talk about some aptamers that we've discovered for these signals that could be useful for fertilizers. We, we characterize using a suite of chemical techniques, and I won't get into them in this talk because I think that that's not the real point of this talk. I want to really get into the applications for you, but it takes a lot of effort, and, and the more you understand about the system, the better you can apply them, you, the more likely you are to be able to apply them successfully. And then at the end of the pipeline is using these tools to solve problems, and that could be things like lateral flow assays. These are like dipstick tests. I'll talk about them in a minute that detect all sorts of different things. To show you a, a little tiny video that comes from my students, they danced in 2010 for Science Magazine's Dance Your PhD competition. They danced the process that I'm going to explain to you in a minute for finding aptamers. They won the whole thing. So the the even though this is kind of this abstract kind of scientific concept, if you if you take a look at this video, even my mother says she understands what I do now in the lab. So if I don't do a good job explaining what aptamers are all about, please go to YouTube and Google Dance Your PhD Aptimers. All right, so let's take a look at how we find aptimers. Um, this is an important point because we can't design them yet. So the, we don't know enough about their properties um, to just from, you know, ab initio, from first principles, design an aptimer sequence. So we have to do a screening. We have to search for them in libraries of aptimer sequences, of DNA sequences. So we start off with a very large library of DNA sequences. 
This could be, you know, 10 to the 15 different sequences of DNA that we make in our lab. It sounds like a lot, but it's really not a lot of material. And somewhere in that haystack, right, is there one, one squiggle, right, one sequence that will actually bind the target we're interested in. That's what we're hoping to find. So it's a challenging ask, but, but it's doable. So we take that library and we incubate it with a target. This is a, a mycotoxin target that, that uh, I'm showing you in this figure. And what we do is a number of different techniques to separate the DNA sequences that bind to the target from those that don't. So maybe some kind of filtration or some kind of other separation. And we only keep the sequences that bind and we discard the ones that don't. After we collect those, that small few, we started out with maybe 10 to the 15 different sequences and now maybe we have 10, right? So, so we do an amplification step. If some of you are uh, familiar with biotech, we use polymerase chain reaction, PCR, to make lots of copies of our DNA. And then we have a, a new library enriched in our binders and we repeat the process again and again. It takes about maybe 10 cycles to really weed out the, the non-specific binders and find the aptamers in this library. So this is something that what I really want to stress is we do this on the bench, right? So this is something where we can control a lot of the conditions that go into this experiment. So for example, you know, we are as chemists, I might say, I don't want just regular old DNA to be put into this experiment. I want to have DNA that has fluorophore, so something that glows on it so I can make a sensor or or something that uh, is a, a building block for a polymer so I can make a coating. I can I can do that to the initial library because I'm working with a synthetic thing. The DNA we're working with is synthetic. We can control the conditions of the binding. So if someone says, okay, Maria, we need to find an aptamer that binds to this target toxin in corn matrix, then I can make sure that this experiment is set up such that it looks a lot like the application. So it's in corn matrix, it's at the right temperature, it's the right solution, it's the right everything. So that is something I can control, which makes it more likely to be able to uh, be applied to the problem later. Then we can play around with that, that separation step. Uh, I can make it more stringent, so I only find the best binders, or I can make it less stringent and I can find something that's a little bit binds at a weaker affinity, if that's what I need. And I can make it more or less selective depending on things called counter selections. So if you tell me, I Maria, I need an aptamer that binds this molecule here, but I don't want it to bind the molecule where this OH group is not present. Say this little part of the molecule is not present. It's really important it doesn't bind that. Then I can do a counter selection where I put that other target into this exact same process, except I throw away the sequences that interact with it. And in that way, I'm really whittling down the library to only the ones that bind the target I want and aren't fooled by any other target molecules. So this process, it goes on and on for so many rounds. And then at some point we decide we're ready to figure out what's inside this library. So we use sequencing, typically now next generation sequencing, where we can get lots and lots of sequences, millions of sequences, and we'll do analysis and sort out what sequences look the most promising. And somewhere in, in that process at the end, we get an aptamer. So what can we do with these aptamers? What are some advantages that these you know, building blocks have for technology that maybe other receptors don't have? Things like antibodies, for example. Um, this is a synthetic uh, product, really. So I can put all kinds of modifications on it. Like I said, I can make this uh, something that will glow. I can make this something that uh, is part of a coating because I synthesize this at the end of the day. This DNA is not something that's extracted out of a out of a living system. It's synthetic, so I can do all kinds of modifications really with ease. So that's an advantage, and it keeps the cost down too. The other thing that's nice about these sequences is that DNA is known to have the property that it binds to its complement, right? It binds to its partner sequence. So that partner sequence for the aptamer is kind of like an antidote, right? So if I'm using these aptamers as some kind of therapy, for example, I can add the antidote if I need to tune the properties. It's also useful for things like sensors. It can help us turn on and off the sensing as we need it by having that extra little complementary uh, property. Okay, great. 
So with that background in mind, let's take a look at some examples of the things that are going on in our research and, and, and other people's labs who are doing aftermer work um, that to show what kind of applications you might find in this field. So the first one I want to talk about really briefly is this idea of using the, the binding ability of aftermers for something straightforward like detection, right? I want to make a strip that you, we can use, we can dip it into the sample and you can say, oh, there's this toxin present or no. So the, the application we've been spending, you know, many, many years on has been mycotoxin detection. So mycotoxins are, are uh, these um, natural toxins. They come from mold and, um, you know, they're, they're important agricultural toxins because they have a big economic impact and certain of them have a big health impact too. So here's just a few example structures of the, aftermer, of the uh, mycotoxins we have aftermers for. And, you know, you probably are, are aware of, of the sorts of things you see in wheat and corn when you have um, these fungal diseases and mycotoxins could be part of that problem, could be part of the, um, the concern when you see these sorts of things. So when, when you have something obvious like physical damage, then you probably don't need a strip test to tell you the, that there's, this is, shouldn't be eaten. But definitely these toxins can be at low enough levels that they're not easily visually detected, um, but they could still pose problems. They could be at levels that would have problems for regulation or, or for, for health. So we've developed some really easy to use, super, super inexpensive strips they're called lateral flow assays. They're, they're akin to like dipstick tests you might do at the doctor's office to check for an infection. You basically would dip in the, into the solution and the solution will pass over the strip. And then you'll see different colored lines depending on if you have something present or you don't. The way we've designed these strips is that there's a, an aptomer inside that's, that's bound to a colored particle. It's a gold nanoparticle. And when there's no target present, the aptomer is attached to both of the lines. So we'll see two lines when, when, the, when the answer is no toxin is present. When the toxin is present though, the target, that toxin, basically the aptomer lets go of the gold nanoparticle, that colored particle, and holds on to the target instead. So we lose the signal that's at the test line. So if we have no target present, no green ball in this case, then we see two lines. But if we have target in, in the in this food or in the solution, then we lose that line. So it's a kind of a signal off sensor. And so we've published on this and, and, you know, scientifically, we've done a lot of work to try to optimize this. But more recently, we've actually been going out and getting real samples. In this case, grain samples, this is from a collaborator at the University of Guelph, which is, is also in Ontario, but it's a, this is an agricultural campus. And they're very interested in, in mycotoxins and, and um, how to detect them and how to, to prevent them or to mitigate them. And so here's a couple examples. This, these are control strips. This is after we've taken apart. They're, they're kind of cased in plastic after we're done putting them together, but now taking off the plastic lid so you can see everything all at once. Um, these are control strips. You see that there's a dot at the test line, and that's kind of a, a control line to make sure that the strip is working. So we're looking at this dot here. As little as one part per billion or even 0.5 part per billion in these samples of this toxin, in this case it was ochratoxin A, we see that we've, we can really easily by eye tell that there's a difference. We've lost that second dot. And we did a, you know, a number of real samples blinded and we were actually pretty good. We only had two false negatives in this kind of small little subset we did recently. And those false negatives were at points where, where the toxin level was so high it basically interfered with the test. So I think in these in these more intermediate scenarios where you're not sure if there's toxin present, these strips could be really helpful for making decisions about, you know, uh, at the grain elevator, at the farm, wherever. So we're really excited about these and we're, we're moving on to all sorts of other agricultural toxins to see if they, this can be applied more widely. So other than food safety, though, other than detection, what about beyond detection? Are there applications for these aptamers? And we think yes. And that's where I think the most, the majority of my talk will be today is just to talk about this idea of the smart fertilizer. So, so let's take a look quickly at this little, this little cartoon. The idea is that we want aptamers to add a layer of intelligence to sensors, to coatings perhaps, so that you know the, the farmer doesn't need to know what's going on in the soil. The, fertilizer figures it out and responds to it, right? So the idea is that these roots of the different crops that, uh, that we, we may be interested in may be releasing 
chemical signals, exudates they're called, that we can decode. And if we could decode them and find aptamers that respond to certain of these signals, maybe we could make products, coatings or sensors that could be a part of, you know, a more smart farm, right? So the fertilizer will release the, the, the nutrient when the crop needs it. Or perhaps a sensor alerts, you know, a home base that this plant needs more nitrogen or needs more water or needs more whatever. So that's the kind of idea, this, this, how can we use aptamers in a big, a smart farm kind of scenario? That's something I want to explore with you guys. So I think for this audience, I probably don't need to present a case about why we need to make some, uh, something like a fertilizer nutrient more quote unquote smart. Um, there's a need to improve the use efficiency of fertilizers, right? We don't want, there's, there's nothing wrong, inherently wrong with the nutrient itself, but if it gets to the wrong place, if it ends up washed off, um, if it ends up mineralized, if it ends up getting, becoming volatile, then, then it's, it's, could cause environmental impact, we want it to get into the crop. So we want to use, you know, fertilizers more judiciously. So how can we make them more efficient at what they're supposed to do? Go to the crop, feed the crop, not feed something else, basically. So I think this video should work. And let me just get it started. So the idea for this project, this is a collaboration with Agriculture Canada and, and us at our university. The idea is that the hypothesis we started with is that crops are constantly releasing chemical signals to the environment. That's those blue spheres that you're seeing coming out of the roots. And some of those, you know, they, they may be for all sorts of different things, but certain of those signals may be a clue to the needs of that crop. Maybe some of those signals are coming out as a, a, a sort of stimulus to mineralize nitrogen, say, or to, to do uptake nitrogen. So what if we made products that were, say, a protected fertilizer pellet? So, you know, hopefully protect against loss. But when one of those signals comes in that says, hey, I need nitrogen now, that's when the nitrogen is released. Or maybe that's for a micronutrient or for phosphate, potash, whatever. So we were interested to see, working with our Agriculture Canada collaborators, could we make receptors, those yellow squiggles, the aptamers, that could recognize key exudates and be put into coatings that would allow for smart release. So the crop needs nitrogen, that's the only time the nitrogen's released, or mostly, you know, it's mostly protected except for at that point. So that's what we were going for. And to be honest, it was, it was science fiction at the beginning because, you know, we had a lot of uh, great ideas, but, you know, it took a lot of basic science to get us to the point where we sort of feel like this could be, be reality. So the main idea is we want to synchronize nutrient release with when the plant is primed for uptake. So in order to do that, we need the receptors that are going to recognize the conditions that are like the plant is primed for release. We need to understand what those signals might even be, right? What would the plant even be releasing at that time and how can we decode those signals? And then we needed coatings, you know, nanomaterials, all sorts of different ideas for how to actually put this receptor in a, in a certain form that would actually be able to release nutrients when needed. So let me tell you briefly about the work of my collaborator, Carlos Monreal. And Truly, I want to stress that this is his vision. You know, he had been working on this idea of exudates being a clue to nutrient needs in a crop for, for, for many, many years. And, and it was uh, uh, just a conversation about drug delivery work that we were doing on a completely different area that led us to um, understand that we could apply our science to nutrient delivery, not just drug delivery. So uh, in wheat and canola, those are the two crops that Carlos have, have primarily been working on, they set, he set up a series of treatments, you know, soil alone without crop, soil with crop and no nitrogen, soil with crop and nitrogen, and was doing weekly characterizations as the growing season was continuing and looking at different stages in, in, the, in the plant growth, characterizing all the compounds that were in the rhizosphere. So all that area around the roots, it was, you know, careful extraction and multiple, um, kind of characterization techniques, mass spectrometry techniques, to decode which signals were present, which molecules were present, um, confirm that those were coming from the crop and they weren't coming from microbes in the environment, so different labeling experiments he had to do, and then not only 
you know, kind of analyze the composition, but then to see how that composition was changing with time. And does any of this link up with when the nitrogen is getting taken up by the plant? So these are uh, these are two examples. Wheat and canola, you know, this is MZ123. These are compounds that Carlos um, was able to detect in the soil. And, you know, kind of basically overlaid with when when these uh, signals were going up and down in concentration, down below you can see when nitrogen uptake was happening. And interestingly, like I think the canola one's a little bit easier to see because there are so many of these features in wheat. The, the idea that certain signals match up temporally with when nitrogen is taken up, that's what sort of, that's the pattern that started to emerge. There were some signals that when um, uh, uh, this a signal is released, it, it coincides with when nitrogen in this case is being taken up. Is the signal directly related to uptake? Maybe not, but reproducibly it could be a surrogate for nitrogen need. It could be a signal to us that this is a time when nitrogen would, would be more efficiently taken up by the crop. So then that was the signal. The signal was sorted out by Carlos and he came to me and to my, my wonderful PhD student, Emily Mastronardi, and said, find us an aptamer that can do the job, that can bind to this key exudate under very unusual, in a very unusual scenario. It's got to be in soil. It probably will be protected, but there's all kinds of nucleases in soil, things that chew up DNA. There's, uh, you know, different pHs. There's all sorts of other compounds that are going to be mixed up in the soil find us an aptamer that's going to work for this. And this is actually just just maybe a week ago been accepted um, in the Journal of Agriculture and Food Chemistry. So you can check out the, the link uh, soon. It should be up. And we actually got the cover, so we were super excited about it. So what were the conditions that we needed to keep in mind and to find this aptamer that would do the job of finding this target? First of all, the aptamer had to have moderate affinity. It couldn't be too strong of a binder because these signals are present in the soil already, so at low levels. So we only needed an aptamer that would recognize when the concentration got to pass a certain threshold. That's when we wanted the aptamer to start working. So it had to be a kind of moderate affinity. So the, the challenge with that is that if you, if you find an aptamer that doesn't bind very well, then that could limit our applications. It's hard to make a good sensor out of an aptamer that doesn't bind very well. Another condition was had to bind in soil solution, like that's challenging matrix. Um, so we ran all our experiments in, a, in an extract that Carlos had given us from soil that he was that was matching the um, the exudate experiments. That's the that's what we did. But a challenge we have to keep in the back of our mind that you know still kind of unanswered question is how much will soil variability impact our binding? If I take the soil that was used in this experiment, but then say I go to a different part in, a, in the world, how, how much will it affect our aptamer? So we still need to answer those questions. And then the last challenge was we needed to be selective for the signal. But there are so many compounds that could be in the soil. So we did counter selections against known soil compounds, similar, um, similar molecules that, that have similar structure to the, the, the signal. But we always have to ask, what about unknown unknowns, <laughs> right? So the signals that we didn't know were there, how will we be sure that our aptamer doesn't bind to them? These are all questions that are still, still around and still need to be answered. So this is, you know, this is all in the paper now, so I don't need to go too much into it, but basically these, these are isotherms to show binding. And basically the long, the long story short, we, we went through a big process to do the selection, found some aptamers, and they were meeting our needs. They were binding with moderate affinity um, and they were selective. And one thing that we had to do that was sort of unique was we had to do something to consider the nuclease resistance of these sequences. So DNA is biocompatible and biodegradable. That's great. We need that for our coding, you know, if, if we're going to make a smart fertilizer because we don't want to, the, the coding to end up having some kind of knock-on, you know, toxic effect in the soil or, or it lasts forever and it becomes something we need to clean up. So that's a good thing. But DNA is very, very biodegradable, right? There are nucleases, enzymes that are present in soil that they will chew up DNA readily. So we needed to find a balance we needed this, these sequences to be stable so that they could do their job, but we needed them still be biodegradable at the end of the day. So what we ended up doing was we made these things called Spiegelmers. We took the sequence of DNA 
and we made the opposite handedness. So you know that um, the backbone of DNA, it, it, there are mirror images, these molecules that are enantiomers, there are mirror images that are possible. And the enzymes recognize one form, right? Because that's the natural form. But if we make the mirror image, it can still do its job, it can still make the pocket, it can still bind the target, but the enzyme doesn't recognize this strange con configuration of the DNA. So, so this is even more synthetic DNA in that sense. So the Spiegelmers were very um, stable. So, so what you're looking at here, you know, without any, the legend on, on the, the left-hand side, putting our aptamers in the presence of a DNAs, an enzyme that chews up DNA for you know, 90 seconds and that one band is chopped up into millions of bands. So lots of different pieces after only a few seconds. But when we take our, our modified DNA, our Spiegelmer, it lasts for hours. This is, this is now on an hour time scale. So this is more along the lines of what we need. We need it to last for, for the growing season, maybe for two growing seasons, not forever, but not 30 seconds either. And we were still able to see binding, so that the Spiegelmer still did the job that we needed it to do. And so then we're at the point now we can do something with this aptamer. There's an aptamer that binds a signal that comes from the crop. So what should we do with it? Well, we have a project where we're trying to make the strips. So we can imagine a scenario where, you know, in say like a home garden or something, you, you're growing something you want to just detect, you know, test the soil and see, oh, this is a time to give nutrients, say, to this, to, to my garden, for example. So it's not a smart fertilizer, but it's giving, it's informing the, the grower, right? So we're trying to make strips in the same way that we were doing for our um, mycotoxin test. But then also we've been interested in making these coatings for fertilizers so that the fertilizer will be smart and released on demand and will not require any output from or input from the outside world. So this now is a series, like we did a lot of science experiments first, before we got to the point where we were, we were looking at making it something that's almost a product, we were just doing science experiments to see, is this even remotely possible? Can we make aptamer coatings that are responsive to signals? And we, we were able to, so you don't need to memorize the numbers, but basically the idea is if we make capsules where the aptamer is in the coating, Binding to the target increases diffusion by 10 times. So whatever's inside will flow out 10 times more easily when the aptamer is bound to its target versus when it's not. So it's kind of turning on and off. We also made a series of experiments where the aptamer wasn't in the wall, but the aptamer was like a mesh inside the capsule. And these were for like burst release. This was the idea. So the aptamer was the kind of support of the capsule and when the target bound it bursts so you see like I don't know how well you'll see it on your own screen but there's that uh, capsules that are burst or, or just debris that was happening from exploding capsules so we had two kinds of science experiments where we were looking at could the optimer be useful for things like release either a uh, one-time release like the burst release or slow release like the the coatings we ultimately ended up using and then more recently, we've been putting all this science together to, to actually make a, a prototype. So we have an intelligent fertilizer prototype that is responsive to a specific signal that's important for wheat and canola. Um, and we're able to show that it's the coating is protective, but releases a bit more when the target is present. So when, the, when in that soil there's this signal, um, more of the, of the nutrient is getting released. This was all, you know, at the level of lab and greenhouse, and we're working really, really hard to get something in the ground this summer for a field trial. This is just some, some microscopy images of the coatings, and what you're looking at, these different components are labeled with fluorophores, and the red in this case is the signal, and the green is the aptamer, and where the red and green are co-localized, it's yellow, and that's telling us that the aptamer can bind the target in that coating um, environment, which is what we needed. So all this is happening and, you know, I just want to give two slides, I think, about the, the big picture idea that, you know, this would be something that could be a part of a smart farm. So in Ottawa, we do have a smart farm that is basically a farm that's, you know, uh, wired up with all sorts of different sensors. Um, uh, there's there's drones, satellites, 5G, all kinds of stuff. So the idea would be to use aptamers to add a layer of knowledge to the smart farm that isn't already there. So the smart farm's already measuring things like moisture. I think I have some pictures of sensors, you know, moisture content, pests, um, pH of soil, that sort of thing. 
how about, you know, it's time for nitrogen in this quadrant because the signals are coming out for, from this crop or or other ideas, maybe, you know, this this quadrant needs uh, 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 some intervention because there are signals that are coming out that are related to uh, encroaching weeds or something. So so you can imagine that this idea could be bigger than just nutrients. It could be it could be all sorts of things. So that's what you know. I wanted to give a plug for for a little um, uh, uh, kind of opinion. Another opinion piece that we did. This was in Journal of Agriculture Food Chemistry a few years ago. Now, uh, the idea that molecular recognition could be useful for all sorts of things in agriculture beyond sensing. So hopefully, get people kind of excited as excited about it as I am. Okay, so that's you know that's one part of our research, and and we have a lot of other things going on in the agriculture space, and I don't want to take up too much time, so I'll just give one little one slide of these other ideas, and then you know I'm happy to to take questions and and to hear what you all think about this. So the two things I want to talk about are other applications for aptamers. So how about aptamers for delivery? So if I uh, want an aptamer to bring a product into say say it's foliar can the aptamer help facilitate delivery into the cells, into the, the root, into the leaf, whatever. And then the other small thing I want to talk about is aptamers can interact with all sorts of different targets. Can they interact with proteins and protect them from stress conditions? And, and can they be used almost as a treatment? And both these things have inspiration from health. So we're doing health research where we have aptamers that deliver drugs to certain cells and we have aptamers that block aggregation in certain disorders. So can, can the health research that's going on with aptamers be used to improve agriculture? Right? That, that's, that's the big question. So just really, really briefly, the idea that we're exploring with um, aptamers for delivery is the idea that we could use that CLX procedure that I was telling you about, that, that selection procedure that I was telling you about, to find aptamers that will bind to, in some way, to receptors or in some way able to facilitate uptake into a surface, so in, into the leaf. So we've done a series of experiments where we've uh, taken those libraries, those DNA libraries I was telling you about, and either doing like an infiltration in early rounds, so so this is now really um, kind of forcefully um, taking that library and pushing it into the bottom of the leaf surface. You guys can see it's all a darker green here, and then in later rounds, just a deposition on the, just on the surface after we've enriched the library to for binders, just a deposition on the surface, and then only keep the DNA that actually made it into the leaves. Right, so doing ex extensive washing and then crushing and then extracting what has been taken up and using that as our, our method rather than, you know, our more binding based experiments I was telling you about for the other selections and then using that to find sequences of DNA that will allow uptake. And if we are able to do that, then we could tether on a payload, put a drug, put a nutrient, put a herbicide, right? We want to attack a weed. The other thing that we're looking at is while we're doing the selection procedure, can we do counter selection? So this is a, a crop I want to feed, but I don't want to feed a weed. I'll do a counter selection. We've started doing that where we, we do another selection. We throw away the sequences that are taken up by the weed to make it selective. And so down here, it's, it's not really that important, but these are gels to showing that this is working. So the idea that we, we put our library onto the bee, this is from round two, so very early in the process, we, we have a band that corresponds to the DNA library, and we can see it's a lot of it is in the washing. So when we deposit it, and then we let it sit, we incubate, and then we wash it off, and we see how much DNA is left in that washing. Most of it's in the washing. And you know, pretty much none of it is inside the the that's the the taken up. But then by round five, we're seeing that we're starting to see the DNA is showing up in the actual sample after the washing. Comparing this is the washing, so this is all the stuff that didn't make it in, and we're starting to see sequences that have made it in. So we're at the point where we're we're analyzing now. We're we've done sequencing, and we're analyzing those sequences to see if any of them could be um, our kind of a drug delivery vehicle. So they could be something we could use to facilitate uptake of some other product into the plant. 
And then the last thing I wanted to talk about was this idea of um, protein aggregation inhibitors. So we have aptamers that we've been studying on, on the health side, whose job it is to inhibit kind of pathological aggregation of proteins. So this is important in diseases like things like Parkinson's. So Parkinson's disease, um, there's a protein that aggregates and as it aggregates, um, it damages neurons and then you le it leads to Parkinson's symptoms. So we have an aptamer, that's what I'm showing you is this picture, that can stop that aggregation event um, and basically let the protein stay in its, its natural form and not this pathological form. Well, it turns out that talking to, to other people in egg that there are a lot of similarities with protein stress response in plants. So stress response in plants, there the there's heat shock protein, and its job is to see that when there's protein that's aggregated inside the cell and to lead to a response to that. So if we could find aptamers that could stop protein aggregation, then those might be useful as sort of non non-specific heat shock proteins. This could be a treatment to help um, uh, plants survive, you know, drought conditions, uh, uh, it's extreme heat conditions, these kinds of things. So what you're looking at here is just some microscope images. This is a, a, a scanning electron microscope that we've been using. And on the left hand side is a control of protein, this protein that is one of these proteins that tends to aggregate. And you can see all these fibers and they've made a giant mass here of fibers. So under the conditions of this experiment, those proteins want to aggregate. And that is kind of a stress response. And then once that happens, it, it, unless you protect the protein, if you let it stay in this form, then um, then that 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 cell is no longer going to be viable. That plant's not going to be viable anymore. You need to have it protected so that when the stress condition passes, the protein can go back to doing its normal job. Here's the same condition, same protein, but the presence of one of our aptamers that does this job of blocking aggregation. And you can see that there's only very tiny little aggregates of the protein, and we're not seeing these big fibers that are get formed that's typical when, when aggregation is allowed to um, happen unimpeded. So we think we have some interesting sequences that can do the job, and now it's a matter of seeing, can we apply them in agriculture space as opposed to in, in the health space? So I know that was a, a lot of different things and I wanted to leave lots of time for questions. So hopefully you've had a chance now to hear uh, some of the things that I've been saying and you understand a little bit about how aptamers work and what their potential is. And most importantly, I think the Exudate story, the smart fertilizer story, I hope that you see that um, there, there could be really cool applications in that uh, nitrogen use efficiency kind of problem where we can use aptamers to, to solve that. And we've got prototypes that, like I said, we're going to try to get in the ground in field trials this spring. And hopefully I'll have really exciting news for you, you know, in the next few years to show that this is more than just uh, an idea where it's actually starting to be put in practice. Okay, so with that, I want to thank obviously the, all the students who do all the work. Uh, my collaborator, Carlos Monreal, in particular, because he's been, you know, just a, a real guiding force throughout this whole work and, and a great uh, collaborator and friend. Uh, other people who I've, who I've collaborated with, uh, funding organizations, and you for, for your attendance and your, and your interest. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Maria. Thank you, that Maria. Was, that was, oh, go ahead, oh. Wade. Well, go ahead. Yeah, I'm still here. Um, I should mention I'm going to have to run out. I was able to get a, a, a an appointment for a COVID test, so I'm going to have to dash here in a minute, but I still have a few minutes and I wanted to just tell Maria that if uh, if you were here in person, we'd be giving you a roaring applause right now. That's really, <laughs> really great, great so presentation and it's Thank very you. fascinating. Um, I'll go ahead and begin with the first couple questions Please. and then I'll, I'll probably have to take off. Uh, the first question in the box is, um, do you envision that the aptamer test strips will eliminate the need for regulatory lab testing of mycotoxins? Or would a more uh, field-based testing to decide samples need to be confirmed in the lab? That's a great question. So where we see this technology fitting in into the big picture is more like a screen. So, so definitely when you get those questionable cases, or even if you get a, a, a positive, you say, okay, this is you know, uh, there's a level of mycotoxin in this sample that's above, you know, our regulatory limit. 
you're going to want to confirm that. It's just like in health testing, you get a screening test and then you're like, okay, I need to now really dig in and make sure that this diagnosis is correct. So you're still going to need the, 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 the labs that test the microtoxins using things like mass spec, LCMS. So really um, able to, to pinpoint the exact uh, values. But where I hope this would be a cost saving kind of um, technology is that you could do many, many samples quickly, cheaply to get the overall picture and then only test the ones that are, you know, suspect or really that really need testing. So, you know, sampling is a big issue for mycotoxin testing. You know, you get a big lot of grain and, you know, you have to make a sampling plan to make sure that you're actually really uh, getting a good sense of where there could be toxin present. It could be, you know, really localized in one area and nowhere else. So if you test, take the wrong sample, you might not get the, the right story. So the idea to do more samples for less cost could be that could be valuable. So this won't replace the those those big labs. Those are still going to be very important, but hopefully you could save a little bit of money by doing some screening first. That, that gives you an answer that you can then confirm using the more expensive methods. Great question. Thank you. That's great. Um, I'll answer the, uh, the second question. Actually, we were talking earlier telling you that Christian Demka is now here at the station. Yes. The second question is from Christian. And he says, um, um, he says, he says, recall that I visited with you and Carlos in Montreal yes. in 2015, and he learned about your smart nano fertilizer project. He says, yeah, he's now at here at the station. So recently yes. uh, he saw a snippet of an advertisement on the web about a patent application for smart nano fertilizers yes. by Carlos. Yes. And he was curious to know whether this related to your apt aptamer based system and which of the nutrients the application is concerned and, and whether or not it's been approved and now in the marketplace. Amazing. And so, also, yes. And lastly, would you be interested to, in, in evaluating that crops? Absolutely, absolutely, we'd be interested. So we're at the point, you're right, we have um, patents that's out and we're looking for partners. We're not at the point that it's been, the, um, that's a product yet, we made a prototype. So we can, um, like I said, we're gonna try to do some field testing this spring. So we're kind of, we're getting there. Uh, I would, we should definitely talk if there's a way to, to look at. So this is for the prototype, we have a bunch of different projects, but the one that's the furthest advance that we actually have, you know, something in hand is a, is a coated urea pellet. So it's nitrogen and the coating is responsive to signals for wheat and canola. So it's a little bit, you know, it's not clear. It could be applied to other things. We're not sure yet. We've done the experiments for wheat and canola. I get asked a lot, you know, can this be for corn? Could it be for something else? Um, we don't, I don't have the experiment yet to, to confirm it. But it could be, you know, wheat and canola are, are, are OK, obviously they're not that similar. So the idea that the co the the signals were in, we found one that was in common for both of them tells me it could be more broadly used. So I would love to talk about um, ways to evaluate this. Definitely. Well, thank you. And I'll, thank I you. need to take off this and I'll leave this with Jason. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks, Wade. Um, so um, third question. Uh, can aptamers be designed to bind to inorganic molecules or ions? Great question. So there's there are aptamers that have been developed for metal ions. So they're they're usually what what's out there and we've worked with them as well are usually things like, OK, we want to detect, you know, heavy metal uh, contamination. And so using the aptamer for that. So that's typically what they've been done that they've been used uh, for. The, the issue that can come up that has to be considered when you're designing that experiment is that the the the, um, the building block DNA, it's negatively charged, right? So it has a negatively charged backbone naturally. So there's automatically going to be kind of a background, non-specific interaction with anything positively charged. So we have to, if you want to do a selection that's going to be looking for something specific for some kind of metal ion, um, inorganic ion, positively charged, then you just have to keep that in mind and you have to design the experiment carefully. So people have been successful in some cases, it's just not as broadly, um, hasn't been broadly applied. So there's still room for improvement there. Yeah, I guess maybe continuing on that point, I mean, one, sure. one, application that would certainly be of interest would be arsenic in food because uh, obviously sure. the regulatory limits really should be for inorganic arsenic and for exactly. some um, some commodities that there are. So if, if yes. you could have a, 
an optimer based test that could differentiate organic versus inorganic arsenic that would be really interesting that's a really good question so there is a uh, there is an arsenic uh i think i can't remember if it's three plus or five plus optimer it's it's kind of facing some scrutiny right now because uh there's someone published a paper recently saying it doesn't really work other people say it does work so there's some controversy about it but there is some precedent so the idea that you want to find one that discriminates inorganic versus organic you can imagine setting up the experiment where you counter select against organic forms and keep so so it's definitely possible okay great uh so next question is actually the, the one you kind of addressed but i'll, I'll ask it again it's it's yes. um it, if you're going to, do you have to make these smart fertilizers differently for different crops, essentially, because the exudates of monocots and dicots are different? Right, right, exactly. So um, that's a great question. So the, like I said, the experiments that we've done, Carlos is really, really in-depth experiments that that unraveled, you know, the signals that we, we investigated was just for wheat and canola. And what he found was that there were lots of signals that were different. So, so certain signals uh, that we could have used for that have that temporal kind of pattern uh, would have been unique. And then there was a, there were a few of them that were in common. So I think my gut instinct is that we're not really looking at a signal that is 100% related to nutrient uptake. It's not that this signal needs to be released and that's when the that uptake happens. I have a feeling that it's just kind of a correlation. It's not causation, right? So it just happens to be that these signals are released at this time when this is needed. So if that's true, then I would sort of have more hope that it would be we, the chance of finding a common signal under different types of conditions and different types of crops. I feel like it could be. We just haven't done the experiment. So I'm, I'm, you know, not ready to say yes, it could work for corn or others. Um, but I feel like there's a good chance that we could find a signal that would be a common signal. You know, you could, there's pros and cons. You could imagine it would, might be nice to have kind of these niche product, right? Oh, this product, you, you, oh, you, you live in this area, you're growing under these conditions, you want to grow the specific uh, variety. Oh, wow. Let me, let me, you know, give you this very boutique uh, fertilizer for you. But for these bigger crops, you need something, you know, to make a big impact on food security, for example, it would need to be something I think general, cheap and general. So I'm hopeful that that one signal will do the job for many many plants maybe along those same lines um yes. how how big of a how big of an issue is is my, you know our microbial exudates when you're trying Absolutely. to find that that signal i'm i don't have a sense so for you know, what percentage is coming from the plant and what's coming from the bacteria the microbiome exactly. in the that's plant. such a good question so this was a big big worry right because we're just we were just Carlos was just measuring the rhizosphere and at the beginning. So where are these coming from? I mean, does it does it matter if the if the microbes are receiving? It could matter, right? If it's the microbes that are giving the signal versus the crop, then maybe the soil conditions would make a difference. So there's lots of reasons why we 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 thought we needed to pinpoint that these were coming from the crop. So what he ended up setting up were these um, kind of really complicated uh, labeling experiments where the crop was grown in in these sort of um, containers that were were you know non uh, no air was be able to come in and out or very minimal and it was pumped with labeled carbon dioxide and so it the the carbon signature from the label was what we were looking for in the um, in the exudate at the end and also nitrogen was labeled and i think in the end they had one more label but i can't Think of it right now. So they did a bunch of labeling experiments. So so the only way that the exudate could have that label is if it was coming from the plant and not from the microbes. So I thought that was pretty clever. So so I'm con pretty convinced that these are coming from the crop. Maybe in the big scheme of things, it's it doesn't matter because certainly there's an interplay, right? So if the microbe, if the idea of the exudate really is to feed microbes, and that because they're saying I need nitrogen, maybe the, the idea is to feed the microbes so that they're able to somehow you know support them. Um, like that symbiosis maybe maybe it doesn't matter where the signal is coming from but i think it my gut is that it does matter so i think you're right i think we have the it has to be a, a signal that's coming from the crop so carlos was was really keen to, to at least for us prove that that the signal was labeled in such a way that it's coming from the plant great uh so some more questions have come in um Please. how do you design your aptimer library 
Good question. So the, the DNA library, people have different opinions on how this should work. We keep our libraries very randomized. So the, the goal for us is that when we start the experiment, the, the DNA is, you know, one quarter G base, one quarter A, one quarter T, like the building blocks of DNA, G, A, T, C, that it's, it's completely, you know, equally distributed so that we're just kind of not biasing one sort of sequence over another. Some, some other labs do things differently. They, they try to add uh, more of one base or another because they're trying to get a certain shape. So, so you know the goal in the end is to make that sh a nanoscale shape. Some shapes are already known to have interesting binding properties, so they're trying to get those shapes. We're try we try to keep it, you know, just anything's anything goes. Let's see what, what whatever we can get out of the sequence. So on our DNA synthesizer, we build the DNA. It's it's a it's a solid phase synthesis. It builds on a bead, uh, one base at a time, and we try to keep everything as random as possible when we do our libraries. Okay. Um, can aptamers be designed to carry nanoparticles? I, I, yes, absolutely. So um, there's two two ways people are going about it. Some people are trying to select aptamers that interact with the surfaces of particles. So that's you know kind of very high tech way. And others just use other surface chemistry. So you can use um, aptamers can be labeled with all sorts of different kind of linker groups, and some of those linker groups can bind to the surface well of a nanoparticle. So like for example, thiol, so sulfur. Sulfur interacts really well with gold nanoparticle surfaces. So you can tag the aptamer with the sulfur group and then it will stick almost covalently to, to the surface of the gold nanoparticle. So it depends on what the particle is, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, there's chemistry to do it. Okay, next question. Have you done any work on using aptamers for virus diagnosis? Oh, what virus would you be talking about? Yes, actually, yes. Yeah, so we do have a we have an aptamer for um, uh, we we've done this in the past. So we have an aptamer that's a kind of a test that we we're working on for norovirus, which is that uh, really bad uh, stomach flu. But um, we're also working on on uh, coronavirus. So so yeah, we're we're working on a strip test and all that sort of stuff. I think everybody everybody's trying <laughs> to detect COVID nineteen. So yes, it can be. This this is something that's really cool about this technology, the uh, target molecule can be almost anything. So it's, I won't say anything because, of course, there are things that DNA, doesn't matter what you do, there's no way the DNA would interact with that molecule because, um, you know, there's certain interactions you can imagine happening. And if something's really greasy, for example, really hydrophobic, DNA is not going to bind too well to it. But viruses, bacteria, cancer cells, um, drugs, there's all sorts of molecules that we can develop out for as well. I must be getting numb to COVID because when I when I read that question, I thought plant viruses. Yeah, OK, yeah, and, and it, could, it could be that it's plant viruses they're talking about. And there are aptamers out there for that, too, as well. So, yeah, I just I, I'm always now every, every, every talk that someone will ask about COVID for sure, because it's such a, you know, it's on everybody's mind. And like I said, everybody's trying. Everybody's trying to make that strip test, that easy test that we're going to be able to use. Uh, so, so we're we're in that group as well. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, in the lifetime of nano fertilizers, the longer is the better. So, do you think mm -hmm. it's possible to basically design materials that that last multiple multiple growing seasons, multiple life sure. cycles of a plant by changing the kind of the chemistry? That's a great question. So, I think there will be a limit because, like I said, the the I didn't really talk about the coatings because that's not 100% my chemistry. We had collaborators for that. But the coatings are, you know, um, biodegradable, biocompatible type coatings, like cellulose type coatings. The, the DNA is biodegradable. So I think, you know, there is a limit to how long you can let this thing stay in the soil. Our, our thought is that there's two ways we can imagine it. You, you have something that's a, sort of a rock. It's, it lasts forever, and then you just you put it down, and, and then growing season after growing season, you know, it's it's releasing when needed. The other way to think about it is to, you know, it only lasts a certain amount of time, but you add way less. So you don't need to add, you know, it's it's it takes, you know, 80, 90 percent less fertilizer to do the same job because it's protected and it only is released. So you, so even though it doesn't, you know, you have to apply, you can apply way less. So there's two ways you can think about it. I think anything's possible. If we change the coding, you could probably get something that's more stable, but then I would just be 
the only thing I worried about is that it lasts too long, it's too persistent. Then you have maybe environmental impact. So you have to keep it in mind. Okay, uh, another question. Um, nice talk. Can these be engineered uh, to be tagged to proteins in vivo? <laughs> Basically, could you express an aptamer fuse to a ubiquitase right. to recognize a viral antigen and then have that ubiquitase tag the viral, viral. protein degradation? Love that idea. So we're not doing any of that right now, but definitely other people are working with, for example, RNA aptamers that they're able to express within the living system relatively easily, and then to use them for these sorts of applications. So uh, at a glance, I would say yes. I'd have to like think about it a bit and and read a bit more into all the different components. But the idea of in vivo expression of an RNA aptamer usually it's a little bit easier to express the RNA ones. Um, yes, that happens. And then do they do their job? Yes. And there's like a whole field of synthetic biology where they're using aptamers in living systems to, to control all kinds of pathways. So, so it could be super interesting to think about, you know, tagging something and then having it, you know, go off for, for degradation because of what the aptamer did. I think it's possible for sure. I'll need to look more into it so we can, uh, you can send me an email, we can chat offline, but definitely the RNA versions of these are uh, often used in vivo as an expression. The DNA ones usually are delivered. Right, so the DNA ones are more stable than RNA ones, which is great. But uh, the machinery of the cell getting an RNA to pop out is a little easier. So, so yeah, that's, there's pros and cons. Um, first, so for your agriculture applications, you were yes. looking at soil. I mean, if you're going to do a foliar application of these, how, yes. how much? How much do you have to worry about the environmental conditions uh, in terms of UV light and you know Absolutely. more dramatic so the, changes in moisture? Good question. Good question. So UV light. So DNA is susceptible to UV light, right? So um, the the T base thymine, when exposed to UV light, will dimerize, and this is you know part of all kinds of stuff we see with them um, with UV damage in in our cells. So so definitely you have to be careful um, if it's going to be something that's unprotected, sitting on a surface of a leaf for for an extended period of time. There are things you can do um, chemically to protect the DNA. So this because it's synthetic, we can do some chemical tricks to make the DNA more stable to protect it against certain things. But definitely there will be a limit to what you could do. So it's something to consider. Um, you know. Uh, how long does it need to sit on the plant surface before it's taken up? If it's if it has to be extended periods of time before it would get into the plant, then do we we would need to do something to make sure it stays stable over that long period of time? Um, two more. Uh, sure. So, are your are you, are you guys or is Agri, Agri Food Canada, Canada yes. interested in um, pesticide delivery through this? So through yes. This? Protocol. Absolutely. So, so there are two kinds of ideas that we have in this. So, um, Carlos is is more focused on the nutrients, but definitely other people are interested in the idea that you know the signals could be something like, uh, uh, um, like I was saying that the alleopath allelopathy or whatever. There's an encroaching weed, so I need to. So there are signals that are coming from the root. You can imagine you apply the herbicide when you see those signals, or the plant is under uh, attack. It's being chewed up. There are signals that might be released. Okay, we need to release this, um, or you know, alert the drone, and the drone comes and drops off the the pesticide, or other things like just the that what I was saying about um, the delivery, right? So if we have um, a pesticide that will only get taken up by the surface of the weed because it has some some specific um, sorry, herbicide that's, that goes to the weed or a pesticide that's specific for the pest and won't get taken up by the plant. It won't get taken up. It won't get taken in by other um, other species. That would be something we would be interested in looking at for sure. We're, we're dabbling, but we've only just started thinking beyond nutrients. OK, um, kind of last question. Um, um, so when you so the back end of all this is obviously regulatory acceptance and societal yes, acceptance. I'm absolutely. just curious of the expression on your uh, on the faces of the general public when you when you yes. kind of present this idea. So this is a really, really important question and something that I think we're going to have to do some work because I think um, the fact that these uh, this technology is made of DNA, that it in the general public, it comes with a, a whole set of ideas what DNA means that is not doesn't apply to this, right? So this is not this is synthetic. It's it's just DNA in structure only. There's no genetic consequence. There's this is GMO. All these things that people start thinking about when they hear DNA, that you know it worries them. 
So I think that's something that we it's been flagged for us that it's there that that could be an issue. Um, regulatory wise, too, because, you know, obviously we have to explain how the technology works and how it's how it's different and its safety and all those sorts of things. But I think the general public, that's why I start always with you know, with this audience, I wasn't worried, but I always start with something that says, okay, this is not, you know, the, this DNA as a synthetic thing. This isn't about the biology of DNA. Um, because definitely that's a question that will come up, you know, oh, if I, if you use these afterwards, does it change the genetic makeup of the, of the organism? No, this has nothing to do with that. Okay. Well, I, I actually have some more questions, but I know we're at the hour, so uh, we can touch base off. We'll talk again. Uh, yeah, um, really, really amazing, amazing work, Maria. Thanks for, uh, Thank you so thanks much. for joining us. Uh, maybe, maybe at some point in the not too distant future, we can have you come down because I, I know there's multiple people here who would like to like to collaborate with you. So. I would love that. I would love that. When things get back to normal, I would love to be there. Thanks so much for including me, though. This has been fun. OK, well, um, thanks, everybody, for joining us and uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Bye. Right. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Thank, Thank you very you. much.